and immersive learning and research experience among young physicists in order to help save the futures of the field of science. Through YPM2023, we can highlight YPM2023 is to encourage young physicists, UG and PG students, and PhD scholars to get involved in research in pure and applied branches of physics. As we all know, that selected abstracts presented in YPM2023 will be published in abstract books of YPM2023 with ISBN. So at this moment, I would like to request our HOD Madam, Dr. Momita De, for sharing her valuable thought with us. Thank you, Papia. Am I audible clearly? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, distinguished speakers, esteemed uh, faculty members and researchers, and most importantly, the young and brilliant minds of the field of physics, because this is YPM. A very good morning and a warm welcome to all of you uh, in this second uh, virtual physicist meet at Adamas University. So I'm Dr. Momita De, head of the Department of Physics, and it's my great pleasure to address this esteemed gathering of distinguished physicists, scholars, and researchers from different colleges and universities all across the state. So first and foremost, uh, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to each one of you for joining us in spite of your busy schedule. While we are unable to gather physically uh, due to some technical reasons, but uh, the power of technology has brought us together virtually. So now let me take this opportunity to introduce my department very briefly. As a department, uh, we have here undergraduate, postgraduate, and uh, PhD programs as well. I wish uh, you all could visit our labs and uh, department as a whole, but we do have very good infrastructure here. Very recently, uh, we are planning to open a new program, which is post-MSc Diploma in Medical Physics as well. The approval is pending with the ARB, but we are hopeful that we shall receive it soon. However, um, we still believed uh, that this classroom teaching and even the hands-on training are not sufficient for a comprehensive growth of a student. That's why we regularly organize this kind of international conferences, seminars, distinguished lecture series. This is one of them. And this young physicists meet, as Papia told, that it has hold a very special place. This is the second time we are organizing it. And it has hold a very special place in our heart, uh, for it is a platform where talented young minds can showcase their innovative research, exchange ideas, and foster collaboration that push the boundaries of our understanding. It's a celebration of passion, curiosity, and relentless pursuit of knowledge that defines our field. I urge each or one of the students to grab this opportunity and make the most of the seminar, engage in lively discussion, collaborate, and absorb the knowledge shared by uh, our distinguished speakers. Before I conclude, I'd like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the organizing committee, particularly the faculty members of the Department of Physics and the University Academic Support for their tireless effort in making this event a reality. Thank you. I wish all of you a very productive and enriching experience for uh, this upcoming two days at the Young Physicists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. So I hope all the participants here have received the program schedule of YPM2023. And we will proceed according to our program schedule. And we will share one feedback link after every session in the chat box. So please share your and your suggestion will improve us. And after uh, day two generation, now it is time free, and I am honored to welcome session chair, Professor Aparajita Bhattacharya, madam. Aparajita Bhattacharya, yeah, she is visiting professor in physics in, the, uh, in our department, Adamas University. 
Formerly, she was professor and head of the Department of Physics, uh, Jadavpur University. Her primary area of research is hardened structure, phenomenological, exotic particles related to matter, and her research area also includes coagulant plasma and early universe. She has attended various, uh, very, uh, various uh, uh, international conferences all over the world. She has more than 80 publications in different Journals of international So now, without wasting time, thank you, Papia. I think. Is it okay? Moment. Yes, ma'am. Please okay. continue. Okay. Thank you, Papia, for your kind words. Uh, so it is now the time to start our first session, you know, session of this today's seminar. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, in this session, we have two speakers. The first is Professor Nirma Lokosh, and second is uh, Professor Anir Banthar. Uh, so, Professor Nirmalu Ghosh is a professor in the in Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Iser, Kolkata. And currently he is professor in the Department of Physical Sciences and Center of Excellence in Space Sciences, India, Iser, Kolkata. Iser, Kolkata, he developed and ran bio-optics and nanophotonics nano research laboratory. The group has made important contribution in the area of spin polarization optics, weak measurement, plasmotics, and biophotonics. He's the recipient of the GG Stokes Award in optical polarization given by SPIE. He's the fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and fellow of National Academy of Sciences India. He has authored over 100 papers in peer reviewed journals, international journals, and has also written several invited reviews, book chapters, and textbooks in the area of optical physics and photonics. So, see, he is going to talk us about um, a, a talk entitled "Quantum Weak Measurement Meets Classical Spin Optics and Plasmonics." Professor Chatterjee, so Professor Ghosh, where is Ghosh? Yeah. Professor Ghosh, so it is over to you. Thank you so much for coming to us and you, are, you can deliver your talk right now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, for the kind introduction. And of course, I thank Dr. Day and Dr. Dhara for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, two-day meeting. Uh, let me share my screen and then possibly I will continue. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, yes, it is visible. Okay, uh, so should I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, am I audible clearly? Yeah. Okay, okay uh, let me first thank uh, Dr. Bhattacharya for her kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Day and Dr. Thara and the organizing committee for inviting me to give a lecture in this wonderful uh, meeting for two days. And I wish all the best uh, to this uh, meeting. And I think there will be a lot of stimulating discussions and a lot of uh, mutual learning that everybody learns, of course. The speaker also learns in the process of giving talk. And uh, with this, uh, let me uh, start uh, my lecture. So this is, of course, mostly a research lecture, but I will try to keep it uh, certain things very basic so that it is uh, understandable to uh, Fiji students at the graduate and undergraduate level. So some of those, of course, uh, are, of course, not in the standard curriculum of uh, our physics because some of those are research topics, but I will try to make it simple. So the title of my talk is uh, Quantum with Measurements Meets Classical Spin optics and plasmonics. So I will uh, talk about this. That uh, I will explain that what are these. 
So weak measurement is basically a quantum measurement procedure. It's a very interesting philosophy that I will discuss. And classical spin optics, it's basically related to spin degree of freedom of light. It's related to the polarization or circular polarization. And plasmonic something which uh, deal with uh, the so-called surface plasmon resonance, which we see in the metal nanoparticles or in metal dielectric interfaces. So this talk, I'll try to cover things where there will be uh, some, as I said, that interface between these three things, so weak measurements, classical spin optics, and polarization. And I'll talk about some of the very interesting effects, which are called spin orbit interaction of light and how it happens and how it uh, kind of takes place in plasmonic system also, those systems exhibiting surface plasmon resonance. And then how uh, this philosophy of quantum weak measurement uh, actually fits to this uh, classical uh, optics, and so that's what I will discuss. And I'm of course from uh, Department of Physical Sciences at ISA Kolkata. Uh, before I go to the topic, let me quickly uh, introduce our group. Uh, so our group is uh, Bio-Optics and Nanophotonics group at IIC at Kolkata. And uh, our research area is of course in the domain of optical physics and uh, photonics. So we work both in uh, fundamental areas and also in applications and uh, mostly in the experimental part, but we also do a lot of theoretical studies. So the area nanophotonics, uh, we work mostly on polarization and angular momentum of light, as you will see that some of those things I shall try to illustrate. And as I said, spin orbit interaction of light is a very new topic in optical physics, in research in optical physics, and I'll try to explain that. And I'll illustrate that with some of our examples. Quantum weak measurements, and we also uh, look for device things based on this plasmonic uh, devices for sensing, etc. And we also do some studies in the context of space optics instrumentation. So another area that we work is bio and interdisciplinary photonics. So we try to use uh, the optical techniques that we develop for uh, basically uh, studying biological system, for characterizing biological tissues, and even for disease diagnostics, etc. So this is our uh, current research group. We have these PhD students now, current PhD students, we, of course, have uh, many former PhD students. And at ISA Kolkata, our BSMA students also take part in research. So that is also a great strain. Uh, over the last 10, 12 years, we have many BS student, BSMA students who had contributed to our research. So these are the current BSMA students. We have uh, postdoctoral fellows in our group also. Two of them uh, are here. Uh, we have many collaborators within the department at physics, at chemistry and also many collaborators at the national and the international level. The work that I'm going to discuss is actually mainly done by uh, this PhD students, current PhD students. And uh, so this is a brief outline uh, of my lecture. So first I will introduce uh, what is spin orbit interaction of light. So what do we understand by spin and orbital angular momentum of light and how do they get coupled at an, under certain circumstances. And these spin orbit photonic effects I'll uh, show some of those no novel spin orbit photonic effects that we have experimentally observed and theoretically analyzed in the so-called plasmonic beta surfaces. I'll also talk what are these beta surfaces. And uh, I'll talk about some device aspects that how you can use this spin orbit uh, photonic as devices, just like you do spintronics in the quantum matter system. And then I'll talk about this uh, interesting philosophy of optical weak measurements and weak value amplification. And I will we give example of weak measurements on these spin orbit interaction effects and also weak measurement in the plasmonic beta materials. And then I'll talk about some device concepts using uh, weak measurements. And then if time permits, so I'll quickly show some very interesting uh, applications of our uh, of polarized light in, in the biological and interdisciplinary domain. Okay, so with this uh, little uh, outline, let me just uh, go to the introduction. So. Uh, basically, many of you have been uh, knowing that uh, uh, basically uh, the angular momentum of light is associated with the polarization of light. Uh, so if you define uh, linear and angular momentum of light beam, so it can be Uh, Papia, is it audible now? No, uh, no, it's it, not audible. The speaker is having some sort of problem. Uh, yes, uh, yes. So yes. I will request all the participants to please be patient. Uh, Papia can call uh, Dr. Ghosh and 
I would uh, like to request all the participants to please wait. Is joining you? Is joining you? Oh. There are some record issues. Yes. Yeah. It's because of the weather. Yeah, maybe. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah, actually, there is a network issue here. Suddenly, yeah, I can understand. The problem with this, I don't know why. Maybe for the it? weather conditions. Uh, yeah. Let me just share my screen again. Yeah. <clears throat> so, in case uh, I get again lost, if uh, you have your phone number, copy, you can give me a call. Yes, I you. called you. Obviously, obviously. Mm. I cannot. Sorry. Can you share, sir? Uh, okay. Is it coming now? Yes, it's coming. It's visible. I was here in the last slide, right? Yeah. Just read me. Okay, so uh, I was uh, talking about that uh, light can carry spin angular momentum, but it can also carry something called orbital angular momentum. So this is usually associated with. Uh, the phase front of the light, where spin angular momentum is associated with the rotation of the electric field vector, the orbital angular momentum is associated with the rotation of the phase front. So basically, a twisted phase front, a eventually twisted phase front gives you orbital angular momentum. So if there are L number of twists, then the orbital angular momentum quantum normal is L. That means there are L h cut uh, orbital uh, angular momentum per photon. So these are the two degrees of freedom of light, the spin and orbital angular momentum of light. So they can get coupled under certain circumstances and this can happen uh, by the so-called uh, this geometrical phase of light. So this is a little bit uh, different concept from the usual dynamical phase. I have shown here the two variant of the geometrical phases. So when light goes in a car trajectory, the state of polarization rotates and it depends on the trajectory. And that is actually related to the so-called uh, geometrical phase of light. You can think about that if you have, you have a linearly polarized light, it comprises of left and right circularly polarized light. So this rotation can be interpreted as if 
that left and right circularly polarized light has acquired different phases. And of course, this phase is uh, not a dynamical phase that is not dependent upon the path length that it travels, but it depends upon the how you twist this fiber or how you twist this path. So that is why it is called a geometrical phase. So that is what I have written here that we have a plus theta and minus theta geometrical phase for left and right circularly polarized light. So this is called spin redirectional very phase. There is another variant of the geometrical phase which is called Pancharatnam very geometrical phase. When light goes through anisotropic medium, like for example, wave plate, depending upon the orientation of the wave plate, there is another variant of the geometrical phase that comes, which I have shown here, that beta is the orientation of the wave plate. So left and right circularly polarized light will acquire different geometrical phases depending upon the orientation of the wave plate. For example, if I take a half wave plate, and if I orient it at an angle beta, the left and right circularly polarized light will have opposite geometrical phases of plus two beta and minus two beta, something like that. So when we talk about uh, the spin orbit interaction of light, so as I said that orbital angular momentum is related to the phase variation in the transverse plane. And uh, geometrical phase, as I said, that it is actually spin or polarization dependent. So if you have a spatially varying geometrical phase, that means in the transverse plane, if there is a variation of the geometrical phase, then there is a coupling between the spin and orbital angular momentum degrees of freedom of light. So this is what we call spin orbit interaction of light. When light goes in a curved trajectory, so that there this kind of situation arises. For example, I have shown here some symmetric systems like when we tightly focus a circularly polarized light, then different rays will travel in different azimuthal trajectories. So the Sir, you are not audible at this moment. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, Papia. I think again the connection is lost. Yes, yes, I'm calling. There is terrible network uh, connection. So, so, participants, professors, teachers, please wait. We are going to contact with the speaker very soon, and very soon the meeting will be started. Please, please wait uh, for some time. Maybe within a few minutes, he will join us. Another speaker, uh, keynote speaker of our session one, Anirvan Dhar, sir, he is, he is here only. He has joined the meeting. Welcome, sir, if you can hear me. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, okay, I am here. Okay, thank you, sir, thank you, sir. Okay, let me again share my screen. Some network issues are there in the institute in the last couple of years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Sure. That is the problem. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Uh, this slide, right? I was in this slide. Can someone confirm it whether I was in this slide?
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, you okay. like, sir. Okay. okay, sure. So let me, I'm sorry, sorry for this technical glitches. Uh, let me continue on that, what I was telling, that the spin orbit interaction of light actually takes place through the uh, so-called uh, space varying geometrical phase because geometrical phase connects spin angular momentum. So it is opposite for opposite circular polarization state. And then orbital angular momentum is related to the variation of the phase in the transverse plane. So if there is a variation of the phase in the transverse plane and which is geometrical in nature, so that will couple these two degrees of freedom of light, which is called spin orbit interaction of light. I was giving this example, which we have observed that even in tight focusing, if you come up with circularly polarized light, the tightly focused circularly polarized light will generate orbital angular momentum at the expense of spin. That means if I tightly focused left circularly polarized light, it can generate angular momentum of plus two at the expense of change in the spin angular momentum. Similarly, if you have an inhomogeneous anisotropic medium, so you'll have a specially varying pointer of number phase, and that will also lead to spin to orbital angular momentum conversion. So these are typically in a symmetric system because if you have an azimuthal variation of the phase, it is typically a cylindrically symmetric system and we can get spin to orbital angular momentum conversion. So we have observed this kind of situation in tight focusing, in scattering from nanoparticles, etc. But there is another uh, interesting variant of this spin orbit interaction effect, which is uh, called the spin hall effect of light. Many of you might have heard the spin hall effect of electrons and a similar kind of effect also appears in case of the light beam. So instead of a symmetric system, if you break the symmetry of the system, that means if you generate a geometrical phase gradient, let's say along one of these x and y directions, or even one of the momentum directions, then this will lead to spin dependent splitting of trajectory of light. So that to say that if I start with a linearly polarized light, let's say for example here, and then uh, when, if you have this kind of specially varying geometrical phase, then after passing through that, the left and the right circular component will be separated. That means they will go in slightly different trajectories. And uh, this is uh, known as a spin hall effect of light. So these are two variant of the spin hall effect. One of course is space domain spin hall effect and the momentum domain spin hall effect. Both are related to the gradient of the geometrical phase. If you have a momentum gradient of geometrical phase, then you get spatial domain spin hall effect. And if you have a spatial gradient of geometrical phase, you get the momentum domain spin hall effect. So there are many other such spin orbit interaction effects that typically you see for quantum particles, very surprisingly classical light beam actually mimic those effects. Rotational Doppler effect, optical Raspa effect, plasmonic Aronoff boom effect, spin momentum locking. So this is also a very interesting phenomena, just like you see spin momentum locking in uh, condensed matter systems, you can see in optical systems. So that means that if you come up with this, uh, one of the spin polarized light, for example, in this cartoon illustration, that will guide light in one direction, you come up with another spin polarized light, so that will guide light in another direction. So such a phenomena is known as spin momentum locking. So this kind of spin orbit interaction effects has not only led to a lot of fundamental interest, but also have opened up a completely new paradigm of optical devices. And it has opened up actually a completely new field, which nowadays we are calling spin orbit photonics. So I am showing uh, this cartoon illustration to show that the idea is to tailor specially having geometrical phase. As I said that geometrical phase depends also on the orientation of the anisotropic objects. So locally you can change the orientation and you can generate gradient of the geometrical phase to produce various such interesting effects. In fact, you can generate all possible optical functionalities based on the angular momentum of light. So that is where it has become so promising that you can do that at very small length scale, that is at the nanometer length scale. So this has, this has opened up possibility for on chip integrable spin orbit telephotonic devices. Many different kinds of devices can be done using the angular momentum control of light or geometrical phase control of light, uh, filters, modulators, switches, sensors, isolators, display, data storage, etc. And that has completely opened up a new paradigm of uh, meta devices, which we call the spin orbit photonic meta devices. They are finding a lot of applications in quantum information processing also. The advantage is that because it uses geometrical phase, so geometrical phase is not dependent on the wavelength of light, so that is dispersion free. These are tunable, they are ultra thin and miniaturized, and therefore they can be integrated to chip. But of course, there are a lot of challenges here. So one of the challenges is that the effects that we are talking about, the spin orbit interaction effects, they are typically very weak. 
So one of the tasks is to enhance the spin orbit interaction effects. The other thing is that for device applications, you have to have control and capability. So these are the two challenges that we and others have been trying to address. So we, I will show some of the of our results in this direction. So one of the way that can be done, of course, as I said, that if you generate a very, very large gradient of geometrical phase, so gradient will be larger if you can tailor things at a nanometer lake scale. So that is what we try. I have shown here some structures which I will illustrate later. So these kind of structures are actually fabricated using electron beam lithography. And these are basically nanoscale structures. So if you can vary geometrical phase and at nanometer length scale, then you can produce a very, very large gradient of geometrical phase and you can enhance the spin orbit interaction effect. So this is what I have written. Nanostructured anisotropic medium, plasmonic and dielectric metasurfaces. Some of those I will discuss. And there is another way of tunability is to so-called hybridization of materials. That means if we use two different kinds of materials exhibiting, let's say, different resonances, these two can get hybridized and that can give you possibility of resonant enhancement and tunability. So that is also we have done. I will show some example of that. And the last that I will talk about, which is called the weak measurement, which is a quantum mechanical philosophy. So this weak measurement is used to amplify very weak optical effects. So that is what we have also used to amplify the spin orbit photonic effects. So let me uh, give you some example of this uh, thing that we have done in this context. So this is uh, a basically a spiral structure that we have fabricated using uh, electron beam lithography. So this spiral structure is made of gold. So gold really gold uh, gives you surface plasmon resonance. And due to the spiral structure, you generate basically an azimuthal, uh, azimuthal phase, which is again geometrical in nature. So this leads to spin to orbital angular momentum conversion. The equation that I have written here, this is typically written in form of a Jones vector. One sigma i, if you have sigma is equal to one, that is left circularly polarized light, that is one i. So it will be converted into one minus i, that means one minus sigma i, with a phase of e to the power twice i phi, if sigma is equal to one. So that means it will generate a vortex of L is equal to two. But if sigma is equal to not one, any other thing, then of course there will be conversion, but there will be no uh, formation of the uh, vortex with let's say L is equal to one or L is equal to two. Integral vortex will not be formed. And conversion efficiency is determined by the bidirectionality of this material, delta. If delta is equal to pi, like a half wave plate, if it acts like a half wave plate, then you get 100% conversion, pin to orbit conversion. This is uh, another example, uh, which uh, basically uh, we are using in a symmetry vacuum structure. You can see that this was a spiral gritting like thing. Now we have broken the symmetry and we have rotated the grating in one special direction, which I was talking about. So due to this uh, breaking of the symmetry here, then you can produce a very large spin hole effect of light. You can see that if I come up with a linearly polarized light, left and right circular component, they will go in different directions. So they can lead to directional guiding of uh, waves at the nanometer length scale. Okay, so yeah, am I audible now? Yeah. Okay, uh, because I am always <laughs> suspecting that there will be some problems or not. Anyway, so these are just to show you that uh, these are typically how you actually control this in the nanometer length scale, the geometrical phase to give you different kind of spin orbit effects. So I will give you some other novel uh, spin orbit photonic effects uh, that we have observed recently. Again, possibly I will not go into the technical details, but I like to give you some feeling of that. So one of the effects that we have seen here, I was mentioning about spin momentum locking. This is what we are calling spin momentum spin locking in plasmonic crystals. So this is a particular type of sample that we have fabricated, which is called wave-guided plasmonic crystal. And I was talking about that hybridization of the modes. So this is a particularly interesting system where we use this hybridization. So how? So you can see that there are two things in it. One is the waveguide layer, which we call the ITO waveguide layer. ITO waveguide layer is basically a dielectric waveguide layer. It's 13 degrees higher than air. And on top of that, you have the gold grating, something like that. So these are metallic grating. So the metallic grating will give you surface plasmons, whereas these waveguides, we can give you waveguide resonance. So that is, they are confined within this waveguide. Otherwise, they are not leaky. But in the presence of this metallic layer, so there is a hybridization between the surface plasma resonance and the waveguide. And that leads to the uh, waveguide to be leaky. So that means it will now leak this light in the far field, just like I have shown here. 
and you can see in the far field they will uh, form their diffraction pattern. And you can prove these uh, leaky wave guys in the far field or in the clear or in the moving number. So another interesting thing that this wave guide plasmonic crystal gives you is the so-called phanotype resonance. So many of you would know that uh, the phano resonance is a very unique kind of resonance. It is uh, most of the resonances that we see, they have a Lorentzian line set, but the phano resonance does not have a Lorentzian line set. It actually comes from an interference effect, interference between a very broad mode, which can be treated like a continuum and a very sharp mode. So in this scenario, uh, the broad mode uh, role is played by the surface plasma uh, resonance because it is basically very diant. So therefore it has a very large light. One second. Hello. So this uh, broad mode uh, basically role is played by uh, the, uh, the plasmonic grating here and the narrow mode is played by the waveguide mode that is a uh, waveguide layer that is providing here and they gives rise to phenotype resonances but they also have very strong progression dependence and I have written as anisotropic phenoresonance because you see that the surface plasmons are excited only by the polarization which is in this direction. In the figure it is written as y direction. So this is what we call a transverse magnetic polarization. So the surface plasmons are only excited by transverse magnetic polarization and each polarization here is called a transverse electric polarization. So that does not excite the surface plasma. So there are, therefore, there are two different kind of phenotype resonance we see here. And that is why I call it anisotropic. Anisotropic means the response is different for X and Y polarization. In one case, the phenotype resonance comes due to the interference of the plasma resonance with the waveguide layer, waveguide mode. In the other case, the phenotype resonance appears due to the interference of the waveguide mode with the background photon continuum. So the background photon continuum is like an ideal continuum. So you get a very large, very sharp kind of asymmetric phano resonance. You see here that it is not like a Lorentzian resonance, very asymmetric type shape here. And for the TM polarization where surface plasmon is excited, you can have a broad surface plasmon mode, but you can still see a very asymmetric phano resonance. So this is a very interesting type of uh, hybridized system which we have used. Now, what we have observed here is very interesting is that when you illuminate light uh, through very highly focused uh, system like a microscope here, then if I let's start with circularly polarized light or any polarized light, when you tightly focus it, then you produce a basically spatially varying polarization. So even if your structure does not have a spatially varying structure as such, but you have a spatially varying elliptical or circular polarization, and that interacts with this uh, anisotropic system, which is equivalent to tailoring the structure and keeping the polarization shape. This is just a contradictory and there's a complementary thing. So the effect will be similar here because the, the way I said that polarized light when passing through anisotropic medium, they will generate geometrical phase depending upon the relative orientation of the anisotropic axis. In this case, polarization is spatially varying. There is, let's say for example, if I've shown here the ellipse, the ellipticity, the ellipse axis rotates spatially and it interacts with the uh, with, with an anisotropic system whose axis is fixed. What is the axis of the anisotropy here? Which is decided by the uh, grating axis, right? So therefore you still again get spatially varying geometric axis. And this leads to very interesting effect which we have observed as uh, both, uh, uh, what I, let me just run this uh, video, we can see uh, in the pointer. Right, so what you will see here, that in the Fourier domain, if I start with dry circularly polarized light, you will be guiding wave in one direction. And if I go to left circularly polarized light, you will be guiding wave in an orthogonal direction. So this is what we call the spin dependent guiding of waves, and which is of course equivalent to the spin hall effect of light. But we have also seen the inverse effect of that, which is like in the condensed matter system, many of you may have either studied, that there is the so-called spin injection in solid state system. Here, if you even start with unpolarized light, because if you start with unpolarized light, but due to this focusing mechanism, you can generate a spatially varying progression here. You will again see that if you start with unpolarized light, and if I project circularly polarized progression here, then you will see the wave guiding will be in one direction. And if I project, let's say, left and right, they will be in opposite direction. So this is just two different effects, completely complementary effects. One is that spin dependent guiding of waves in opposite direction. The other 
is that when the direction of propagation will choose the spin. So that is why we are calling it a spin momentum spin locking. So that is a very interesting thing because it may have many device applications also. But simultaneously, you can see spin hole forward and the inverse spin hole effect of like we are telling, of course, it's an inverse spin hole effect because it is like spin injects and depending upon the direction of propagation of the wave. And in this system, as I was saying, that one of the things that we are looking for is that if we could amplify or enhance this spin orbit photonic effect. So in this system, we have used the phenotype resonance to amplify this. As I said, that phenotype resonance shows a fan of deep and a peak. So depending upon the wavelength, if I choose here and here, you will see a different magnitude of this orbit interaction effect. So that gives you a desirable tunability of the effect. So this is one such demonstration that how you can achieve tunability of the spin orbit interaction effect uh, by using a hybridized meta metamaterial. Here, uh, one of the examples of the hybridized metamaterial is this wave guiding plasmonic crystal. So we have also observed some other interesting effect. Just like I'll not go into the details, but just to give you a uh, kind of a feeling of that. Just like we saw spin hall effect, that means two different spin polarizers will be separated in different direction. Here we have seen orbital hall effect of light. So for example, if you come with L equal to plus one and L equal to minus one, they in, within these nanostructures, they will propagate in different directions. So they can be used like an orbital angular momentum sorting, right? So in a, in a nanoscale system, you can sort orbital angular momentum based on this effect. We have also observed spin hole effect of light in a random medium. That is yet another interesting system. Typically, we see this in periodic system, but a completely random system also we have observed this kind of effect, spin hole effect of light. There is another interesting effect we have recently uh, seen here. This is a novel effect. Again, uh, due to the spin orbit interaction of light, we have seen some kind of position position classical entanglement of light. So we know that entanglement means two degrees of freedom where which are non-separable. Uh, in case of quantum entanglement, of course, we can uh, we talk about two systems and we talk about non-locality. Uh, non but in classical system, like in classical light, where what happens is that the two degrees of freedom can get entangled. For example, a spatial mode, like a Gaussian mode and progression can get entangled. So that if I choose a particular progression, we will choose one particular spatial mode. So that way, they also mimic the so-called entanglement without, of course, that non-locality phenomena here, because it is only between two degrees of freedom of light. So we have shown such a position, position, classical entanglement of light emerging from the spin orbit interaction of light. So they also have many applications possibly. We have to check that whether this kind of thing can also be used in the context of quantum information processing, whether the classical entanglement has, it, has any role in that context also. But these are uh, interesting in a, in a sense that uh, this actually can allow you to understand uh, the phenomena of entang entanglement using uh, the two degrees of freedom of light in a relatively simpler system. So I will also show you some of the uh, novel spin orbit photonic devices that we have made based on these uh, effects. One of these uh, is the so-called geometrical phase polarimeter. Let me just give you the philosophy rather than going into the technical details. So when we make uh, want to make polarization state of light, we usually do it by use by measuring the so-called Stokes vector of light. So where you need four or six measurements with different intensities. But in many cases, you want to measure, it's a spatially varying polarization, but in a single uh, measurement, like a snapshot measurement. Because let's say if you are trying to prove a dynamical process, you would like to probe it at a single uh, sort measurement, like in a snapshot. So this particular philosophy uses that. As I was saying, that when, uh, let's say, spatially varying polarization like pass through a homogeneous anisotropic medium, it will generate spatially varying geometrical phase. And the philosophy is that, if you make an interferometric arrangement, just like a magnetic interferometer here, and if some unknown spatially varying polarized light is passing through it, in one of the arm, if we put, let's say, half wave plate and an anisotropic medium, in the other arm, it's nothing there, and you make them to interfere, then you will have a phase difference between them. Because one will give a spatially varying geometrical phase, other is, will the phase will be independent. So you, from the fringe pattern, you can quantify the spatially varying geometrical phase. And that spatially varying geometrical phase is directly related to the input polarization. Because as I said, that geometrical phase is decided by the relative orientation of the polarization axis with respect to the anisotropy axis of the object. So this way, we could quantify the spatially varying polarization by a single sort measurement of an interferometric measurement. Uh, this is another thing that we did, which is uh, a micro beam deflector using uh, spin orbit interaction of light. So this is basically, we called it a 
uh, geometrical spinal effect of light. We use a tilted polarizer to realize the geometrical spinal effect. That means the spinal effect means left and right will be slightly, only slightly, slightly separated. So based on the choice of the input polarization state, you can use, uh, you can actually do so-called microbeam reflector in a very, very controlled fashion. We have used also this plasmonic crystal that I was saying uh, for some sensing applications like arsenide sensing, because the fan resonance is very, very sensitive to, uh, to any changes in the dialectic environment. So these are uh, typical examples that I wanted to give you that not only that they are uh, fundamentally interesting, these effects, but they can give you direct device applications. Now I will slightly go into the next topics, uh, which is, I was saying that uh, weak measurement and weak value amplification. The philosophy of weak measurement was, I will tell you a little bit, but this concept of weak value amplification was originally given by Aronov, Albert and Bateman in this famous paper. And I'll talk about that a little bit and then I'll say that how this can be used in even in classical optics, although the philosophy is quantum. Uh, let me just uh, very briefly without uh, going into the much mathematical details. So when we do a quantum measurements, we couple some pointer or device with the system. And there is a coupling Hamiltonian between the device and the system. And this G, uh, if we integrate over time, so that gives the so-called coupling constant. And uh, how you write this uh, uh, coupling Hamiltonian, so you, this is basically the observable, which is less of the system, some observable of the system. And Q is some observable of the pointer. It can be position or a momentum, just like I have written here. So the pointer has certain distribution. That means it could be Gaussian or something like that. In this case, I have written as a Gaussian. So therefore, there are two things. One is the system, another is the pointer. So the pointer observable are, let's say, position and momentum. And the system may have different eigenstates, just like I have written here. After you couple this pointer, uh, after you couple this uh, device or your pointer to the system, both of them evolve together and they evolve uh, through unitary evaluation. And you can see that after, so let's say there is a coupling in the position space, just how I have written, Q is a position here. Then after this evolution takes place in the momentum space, you will see that there are well separated pointers. So they will be well separated if there is a very strong coupling between the pointer and devices. So to say that the system will now collapse into different eigenstates. And you can read out these values, which is called the eigenvalues, and you can find out the expectation value of the observable. So this is what we call a standard strong quantum measurement. But what AAV uh, proposed was completely opposite to that, that now if the pointer is, let's say, coupled very weakly, so that the system will not now collapse to the eigenstates, almost they will remain unresolved like that. So there will be very little information that you can get from such a system, such a state now. What they propose is that if you now do a post selection, then something interesting happens. So if you now do a pre and a post selection of the states, so this is what I have shown here in a, using a cartoon illustration. Now in this system, in this weak measurement system, if you do a pre selection and a post selection of the system states, then there is a very, very large, unusually large deflection of this pointer which they interpreted as a weak value. And the simple algebra they provided in this way, that in the same way that I was discussing for the eigen value, in this case, we will see that the pointer profile in the momentum space will be deflected by a large value AW, which of course this gamma is the coupling constant. This AW is now only not related to the eigen value of the system. It is also related to the overlap of the input and the uh, output states of the system that you have pre and the post -select. So if you can make these two pre and post selected states to be non-overlapping, very, very small, exact orthogonal will be completely non-overlapping, then it will go up. But if you are very close to orthogonal, then this quantity epsilon is called the, which is a measure of the overlap of the two states, that is pre and the post selected states, it can be very, very small. And then this weak value can be, become very, very large. So therefore, there are two very interesting things that you can have a weak value, which is much larger than the eigen value spectrum. So if you have a very weak effect, like these two pointers were so completely non dissolvable but doing this pre and post selection, you can amplify that and you can observe that. So that is what we call a weak value amplification. Another interesting thing is that, that eigenvalues will always get real, but here the weak values can also become complex. That means it can have also imaginary weak values. So real weak values will lead to the Q domain, that is the position domain deflection. Imaginary weak value means it is a difference in the momentum space. That's how you can interpret the complex weak values. So 
it is a quantum mechanical philosophy but it can still be realized in classical setting because at the heart of it is the so called interference if you uh, if you look into this uh, problem that i was discussing in a very simple way like a two state system like if i am seeing that let's say i was giving example of spin hall effect of light let's say i start with a linearly polarized light and if the two states spin up and spin down that is lcp and rcp they are only just slightly separated with their gaussian mode right so these are the gaussian mode slightly separated and if i post select it at a linear state which is nearly orthogonal to that so what essentially happens is that one of these mode will nearly destructively interfere with this slightly shifted mode why i am going nearly destructively interfering because we are not choosing the exact orthogonal states and that leads to a very large deflection of the Uh, uh, of the pointer, that means the distribution of the beam profile will change to a very large extent. So this is what you can interpret as a near destructive interference effect. So therefore, this can be actually realized in classical optical setting, and therefore you can amplify very small or very weak optical effect using this philosophy, and it can be used for metrology sensing and nanotubing. I will give you one or two examples of those. So in this particular case, there is a weak coupling. which i said that spin hall effect is a weak coupling because it is a very very small deflection between left and right circularly polarized light weak coupling between the spatial mode which is the pointer here and the polarization that is what we are doing the system states here so this is what we could do using uh, this so called uh, uh, weak value amplification uh, spin hall effect as i said that if you typically want to detect the magnitude is typically lambda by 2 pi that is in nanometers using conventional ccd detectors you cannot detect it. but using this philosophy we could enhance this almost 1000 times so you can see the beam jumping around near this near orthogonal pre and post states so it's a very very large amplification of this effect and we could actually amplify 1000 times the spin hall effect of light and we could easily detect using standard ccd so this is an example of just how you could amplify the spin hall effect but there are a lot of other things we did in this context which of course those technical details i will not go to i'll give you another very interesting example of this weak value amplification instead of the gaussian mode you can use the same philosophy in the context of resonance also so that is what we have introduced a completely new concept of weak value in the domain of plasmonics so weak value amplification using spectral line shape of canon resonance as point as i was showing earlier that some of these plasmonic system can give you asymmetric phenotype resonance and this phenotype resonance is actually as lot of applications as we are saying here we have realized a weak value amplification using this phenotype resonance the spectral line shape of resonance instead of the gaussian spatial mode you have just replaced it by the spectral line shape that is what you can think so that means here the weak coupling with between the weak anisotropy between the polarization that means two orthogonally polarized light they have a slightly weak anisotropy between them and the pointer will be the spectral so that is the philosophy so how we do that so that uh, what i was telling earlier showing earlier that is plasmonic crystals we can make different kind of plasmonic crystals so this is very weakly anisotropic plasmonic crystal if you could make it almost circle then it is almost isotropic you made it like this so this is an weakly anisotropic plasmonic crystal and we could tailor this weak anisotropy based on uh, the numerical simulations and you can see that as i have shown earlier that this kind of plasmonic crystals give you phenotype resonance so you are seeing that why phenotype resonance is because there is a plasmon mode which is broad and below that you have a waveguide mode which i have shown earlier so they interfere to give you phenotype resonance and now if these two phenotype resonances for a weakly anisotropic system are almost unresorbable for let's say x and y polarization then we can call it a weakly anisotropic system which will satisfy the weak measurement criteria so in this regard let me just quickly talk about that uh, experimentally how we do it polarization of course we write it in terms of the jones vector but in experimentally we measure it so called uh, the stokes vector which is measured by intensity group of intensities of light you put a horizontal polarizer a vertical polarizer some of them this is a total light difference of them this is the linear polarized component of light then you take i45 put the polarizer at 45 and minus 45 take a difference of them and then you put a wave plate to detect the left and right circular component so this is how you can measure the stokes vector of light and different stokes vector of let's say horizontally unpolarized polarized light can be written like that they can be just written by a vector the four uh, basically coulomb vector is having four elements right so this you can experimentally realize so that is why uh, i am showing this and 
uh, there is another thing that is associated with this uh, preparation is one is of course the Stokes vector of light, but when it interacts with the medium, the state of progression changes, and that is determined by the so-called Muller matrix, which is a four plus four matrix, and all the anisotropic parameters are encoded in uh, this by various elements of this matrix. What is most important is that such a matrix you can actually experimentally measure also by doing polarization projective measurement. So you have 16 elements you have to measure, so you have to do at least 16 measurements. I'll show you later, but this kind of system we have uh, used to do the uh, weak measurement. So uh, how you do that? Basically, we have developed a very unique kind of experimental system. So these are, of course, nanostructure sample. You cannot just uh, do it in free space. So we do it in the microscope. You have to study it in the microscope. So we have coupled this philosophy of uh, uh, polarization measurements of Stokes vector and Muller matrix in a dark field microscope, which is completely developed in house. So what is done here is that in the input end, you have a light source and you have so-called polarization state generator unit. So you can generate four chosen states here. It could be four different elliptical states. It can be, let's say, one circular, three linear, etc. And then uh, it interacts with the sample and then it uh, goes through this objective which collects light. It is analyzed through the so-called polarization state analyzer unit. So you can record the full Muller matrix or you can record any particular projection of the input and the output projection state, which is desirable for doing the weak measurement in our case. And that is what I have shown here that uh, we have tailored this system and we did pre and post selection with both linear and elliptical basis. As I was saying that you can have both real and imaginary weak values. So real and imaginary weak values are reflected in conjugate domain. Real weak values, if it is reflected in the frequency domain, the imaginary weak values are reflected in the time domain. So both uh, we could do, that means we could pre-select and uh, pre-select with less than 45 degree polar side and post-select with nearly orthogonal 45. So that means if I pre-selected with plus 45, I close select with minus 45 with plus minus epsilon off. And we could also post-select at elliptical states. And of course, this shows that this weak value, this weak measurement criteria is satisfied. That if we take the measurement with x fall and y fall, you could not resolve that. This is very, very weak anisotropic, which you could not resolve. And therefore, this satisfies the weak measurement criteria. And then once it's post selected, you could see a fantastic probability of phenomenology. Just like in the spin hole effect, we saw that there is a large diffraction of the pointer depending upon the post selection parameter. Here also, you could tune the complete line shape of the resonance. This kind of tunability have many potential applications. Right? They can have applications in multi-sensing platform, filter, color display, which is quite desirable. So this we could uh, do with relative, uh, relative ease without changing the structure using the philosophy of uh, so-called uh, weak value amplification. In general, this kind of measurement has widened up the scope of weak measurement even in the spectroscopy domain. So this is an example. Another interesting thing we did, I. Uh, not maybe going uh, into the details, that similar weak measurement philosophy in this hybridized system, we replaced uh, this, uh, uh, this waveguide layer by another waveguide layer, which has a very small uh, Faraday effect. So that small Faraday effect acts as a weak, uh, weak, uh, weak coupling parameter here. And here, uh, there is a slightly different philosophy. We use a weak coupling, which is a small Faraday effect of the magnetic optic material, between the polarization, here we use polarization as a pointer and spectral mode as a system. So that means there are interference, as you have seen here, that fanor resonance is basically an interference of a uh, spectrally narrow and a broad mode. And this, uh, this uh, Faraday effect is present in the waveguide layer, so it is only associated with the spectrally narrow mode. So this provides the weak coupling between these two channels. One which does not alter polarization, another which very small, uh, there is a small change in the rotation in the polarization. And this is typically the weak measurement scenario because if you have a near destructive interference, as I was mentioning, the near destructive interference means if you have, let's say, in, in the near the fan or deep where almost light intensity is very small, there you will get a weak value amplification. And what you observe is this small Faraday effect is amplified many times near this near destructive interference point. Spectrally, near the phanodeep, you have a large amplification of the small uh, Faraday effect or small, small magnetic optical effect. So that is what we could uh, also model using weak value amplification that how you could actually amplify very small magnetic optic effect using the phanotype resonance. Near the phanodeep, or that means near the spectral interference deep, 
you get a large amplification which is a manifestation of the weak value amplification so this is another example of that and this particular philosophy that uh, near destructive interference can lead to a large amplification of small effect which is shown here we actually realize this using a typical path interference and we thought that let us now reproduce that we saw it in case of a spectral domain interference but in case of path interference we realize that and that led to a new device which we uh, which we named as weak value polarimeter so the philosophy is the same here that unlike the fan resonance here you are doing the path interference here instead of the spectral domain interference one of these path will give a small anisotropy which you want to measure for example conventionally you cannot measure let's say it's a very small effect now you do a magenta type interference and you will get the interference fringes so near the dark fringe where is exactly destructive interference you are slightly away from the dark fringe you will exactly know that how much you are away from the dark fringe so you can also calculate that how much phase offset you have from the destructive point there you get a very very large amplitude amplitude of this small polarization effect in fact we could amplify all possible polarization effects like optical rotation linear by the fringe circular by the fringe all kind of polarization effects could be amplified many fold almost 100 times amplification and what is important that this kind of uh, weak value we named it as weak value polarimeter so lead to large enhancement of sensitivity using standard stokes uh, uh, polarimetry what you get but if you incorporate this uh, interferometric philosophy of weak measurement you may, you actually get large uh, enhancement in the sensitivity of the polarimeter and we uh, it is in the process of a patent now we have named it as a weak value polarimeter this is another example and uh, and these are the kind of things that now we are targeting that we want to make miniaturize in our big photonic and big measure and meta devices based on nano fabrication so that you can we are leading it towards uh, developing on chip uh, all these from the kind of functionalities to realize in on chip and i shall stop before that i'll just quickly uh, show a few slides uh, to our other thing which is mostly in the application domain bio and interdisciplinary applications of our research so we have developed as i said that is a very unique time uh, kind of uh, polarization measurement system which can measure uh, the polarization parameter and nsp parameter with nano scale spatial resolution at the same time it can also do polarization spectroscopy by integrating the philosophy of muller matrix measurement with a very unique kind of dark field measurement system you could record from single nanoparticle nano structures and we have used it for many purposes one of this uh, i will just quickly show is that uh, there is a very interesting uh, study that one of our chemistry colleague was doing which is basically they are making this so called uh, cell filling uh, crystals and that that was like a serendipity they observed that when you do a two point bending test you can see that this crystal when you apply pressure it breaks and then it uh, magically heals and we could not understand that why it happens we used our uh, Uh, this uh, polarization muller matrix system which could measure uh, the polarization nsp parameter with nanometer scale spatial resolution and we found out basically the reason for this self filling is the so called piezoelectric effect in this uh, in this system what we could do is that i have uh, given a cartoon illustration is that when you bend uh, there is a large macroscopic dipole created between the piezoelectric material which uh, if you break it then there is a Uh, charge separation may be the opposite charges in the faces which lead them to heal this we could actually prove using the polarized light so what we proved is that uh, basically this is what we proved change in the structural order in the nanoscopic building blocks due to the strain which is uh, the origin of the piezoelectric effect and we could actually unravel the reason for uh, this magical cell filling behavior the paper was of course uh, accept, uh, published in science last year and uh, Uh, and this is one ex example where we needed the nano uh, nano sensitive capability of the system to measure because you know these domains that we are talking about uh, where these anisotropic properties changes are very very small in the nanometric domain we have also used such polarization measurement uh, to do a novel kind of uh, the spectroscopic uh, capability of being something we call that multifactorial anisotropic parameter which is again sub wavelength feature otherwise you cannot get but you can get only through Uh, this kind of novel polarization measurement and analysis and we have been extending these studies of course towards biological tissue characterization and diagnosis many such applications we have been doing this is in the application front i will not go into the details i will just uh, stop here 
and uh, thank you for listening to uh, this and uh, giving me of course time and this book uh, particularly i would like to recommend for the students uh, that this is a book that we have written not only on uh, basic uh, academic uh, curriculum of optics wave optics but also some of the things i have just shown here like for example the thing that i was talking about spin orbit interaction of light something you can find in one of these chapters of this book and yeah thank you and i'm extremely sorry that uh, there were a couple of times we have technical glitches due to network failure at our end thank you so much thank you thank you professor ghosh for your nice lecture it is a wonderful talk and uh, as i feel it it is a learning experience you have put together all the theoretical aspect at the same time the experimental application uh, and it's a learning really a learning experience so thank you so much uh, patya is there any question now it is a time to take one or two questions for this uh, uh, yes, madam uh, madam yes. uh, actually i didn't uh, put a question in the chat box okay can i just uh, can i okay. uh, give this uh, bye bye word yeah yeah you can yeah. yes uh, yes uh, uh, professor goes uh, really it's very nice thank nice you. very nice talk and many things uh, we can learn from here also uh, i have some i have some little queries sir uh, yeah. generally surface plasma polarizations has very short propagation length and yes. because the light ohmic loss is there mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. is it effective weak quantum coupling to improve such short propagation length uh, so that is a good question i think that uh, so when we talk about uh, this nano scale devices we are concerned within only uh, propagation in a few micrometers but of course for long distance listing uh, surface plasmons are uh, not the right thing but uh, we have been also working on similar dielectric meta materials because resonances uh, to explain basically the idea we want to explore is a effect of resonance so there are also some resonances which dielectric objects also give like mean resonances etc that is also we are trying to exploit but because if you are only uh, only interested in let's say in a micro size device there it should work you know, because the propagation length is not of course if you go for a large distance this is not going to work because they are typically lossy as you rightly pointed out okay Uh, and sir, another thing: when generally the sample size goes to comparable with the lambda, mm -hmm. then uh, if we talk about the oscillation in that range, say for example in infrared region also, mm -hmm. uh, is there very effectiveness uh, for d electron, say uh, metal, for example, say gold or something like this in that case? Yeah, gold, say gold and silver, so they have. typically their electron absorptions are in the ultraviolet range so if you go in the nir range there the losses are typically um, less eh? because there is no electronic absorption at those wavelengths so when you go towards visible that means if you go towards uh, 500 600 although there are resonances but there are also other losses but if you can tailor the size and say so that to push the resonance towards the nir for example so then the data and typically the fano that i was talking about it happens around 700 nanometer so there you have less losses compared to if you go towards the visible because oh, okay. these intra and interband transitions of gold and silver they are typically in 400 nanometers so if you go towards 400 or 50 nanometers there are huge losses okay sir professor many many thanks i am bimal kumar sarkar professor thank you for the good questions i am really happy that thank you sir thank you yeah, thank you Okay, uh, Papia, is there any question? Any anyone? Any question? Yeah, uh, in chat box, I didn't can, find it. The students, if they want, they can ask you. Can ask questions, and then uh, and we have to. Yes, yeah. uh, you can directly ask students mm -hmm. if anyone want to ask any of them. Uh, maybe, maybe they are hesitating. Yeah, okay, okay, so you can send me, uh, you can send me a question, students, and uh, then I can convey to Doctor Ghosh. Yeah, I can always. So I know. have, I have just one. Yes, I have just one query that like surface plus one resonance wavelength. You say, uh, is there any limitation that it would be within this invisible range, or it can it can be in the uh, infrared region as well? 
how it is varying in the material to material yeah also for example typically people uh, use gold and silver there are other uh, copper etc they also give surface plus one resonances uh, gold and silver typically if you look, so it depends upon the shape if you make let's say spherical typically you see you have only one resonance which is uh, for gold typically comes around 500 550 nanometer for silver it will be around 450 nanometer but the problem is Uh, Dr. Sarkar was uh, asking that uh, the problem there is that because you also have intraband and intraband transitions of the gold, so you have more losses there. So somehow, if you can push those resonances towards the inner vein, that is beneficial in terms of application, and that can be done by uh, tailoring the shape of the um, shape of the nanostructure. For example, we have used rod that you will see that grating-like structures. So the rod there are two resonances. One is a shorter vein, the other is longer vein. So the longer wavelength one is more basic beneficial in a sense that there will be less absorption losses there. In general, otherwise surface plasmons are lossy, right? But because of strong absorption in the metal. So you can tailor the shape uh, to actually uh, avoid loss to an extent. But of course, you cannot completely avoid it because they are intrinsically lossy. Mm. I mean, I think it's very difficult at this moment to ensure that this same and this material and this type of uh, coating um, can give this uh, surface plasma wavelength. This uh, confirmation, confirm estimation. Ah, people, uh, people are also looking for uh, different kind of uh, alloys, mm -hmm. etc. So that is a lot of research going on. Yeah, because, uh, just checking. Uh, loss is one. Yeah. So different kind of alloys people are trying so that. To to reduce the loss and to optimize the wavelength because maybe somebody needs it at at the mm -hmm. NIR range, somebody may need it at the visible range. So a lot of research is going on for practical perspectives uh, perspectives to uh, yes. use different alloys. And there are a lot of uh, we are of course not so much doing in terms of uh, the uh, the um, yes. uh, element composition part of it. And we'll be happy if there are. Uh, good suggestions of uh, materials having less losses. We are mostly interested in the structuring part of mm -hmm. it, so uh, to realize different photonic effects. And okay. loss is generally a problem, which is I, I should mm -hmm. not I should say that in general, uh, of course, as long as you are working with a micron-sized device, no problem. But if you want to do it for large distance communication or something like that, it is a big problem. Sir, you have some some structure. I show whenever you saw the Faraday effect. So yeah, that uh, design is it is it a simulated structure or some lab based uh, fabrications so you have shown? Yeah, let me just show you. So I have missed uh, maybe uh, one structure. Yeah, some plasmonic, structure. One second. This plasmonic crystal structure is uh, fabricated. Uh, so this is not a magnetoplasmonic thing. So this is fabricated. This is the ITO layer. There is an ITO layer. We have an ITO yeah, coating on top of that. Uh, so below you have a glass. On top of uh, glass you have ITO coating, and then you do this lithography. That means you have this gold, and you can make different shapes. That uh, different structures that you are we were showing mostly like that. You have a waveguide layer. On top of that you have uh, basically this uh, gold or other structures. So all these kind of structures that I was showing. These are all basically based on IQ, and these are all uh, fabricated using electron beam lithography. So uh, this kind of structure okay. we okay, now. Thank uh, you. Sir. More complicated structure we are finding it difficult because, as I said, that yes. you can actually, uh, if you can tailor the structure in a desirable fashion, you can realize many functionalities. But with our limited fabrication mm -hmm. facilities, making very complex structures is becoming difficult. But this kind of structure we could fabricate, and we could uh, even do some. Uh, good applications in that context. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank really, you, thank, you. thank you, thank you for inviting me. I think there is no more questions. So let us thank Professor Ghosh again. Sir, thank you so much for making time for us, and we are looking forward to see you in our campus sometimes in future. Uh, thank you so much. I also was telling that I will also love to go. Mean uh, basically go there and interact with students, so that will be good. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. We are also waiting, sir. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sir. Okay. Let me unshare it, right? Uh, stop sharing. Okay.
Yes, the investors. Okay, thank you again. Thanks, thank everyone. You, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'm sorry that I. Thank you so much, sir. No, thank no, so it's much. okay. Technical difficulties is always. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't know why. Yeah. I, I, most of the time, I give uh, these online lectures from our institute. I always face this problem. He is uh, two days back. There was a meeting <laughs> in Taiwan. Again, same thing. I that today I was so scared that I I thought that you should call me because I, know, yes. I cannot even see that. After yeah. five minutes, you realize that you are completely out of. Uh, you are not really audible. That's bad. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks. So thank you. So uh, we are now. Uh, I think Dr. Anivan Ghosh is on. on a, yes, joined us. Welcome, sir. To the yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, our next talk of this session, the speaker of this session is Dr. Anir Bandhar. So Anir Bandhar is, let me introduce the speak, speaker a little bit. Dr. Dhar is a principal scientist working at fiber optics and photonics division at CSIR Center Glass and Ceramic Research Institute, Kolkata. He obtained PhD degree from Jadupur University in 2008. And he, has a, he is a postdoctor, was a postdoctoral fellow in the Institute of Photonics Electronics, ASCR, Czech Republic during uh, 2009 to 2010. Dr. Thor works also as research fellow in Optoelectronic Research Center, University of Southampton, UK from 2010 to 2012. He served as the key fiber developer, demonstrate, uh, developer to demonstrate world first multi mode amplifier, identified novel alternate doping, and recently developed active green fiber to improve fiber laser performance one step ahead. His research interest includes development of specialty optical fiber of various, various uh, types various types to develop fiber-based amplifier, high-power laser, and sensor. He has published more than 100 SCI journal publications, 75 conference papers, all four US patents, written four books chapters, and delivered several invited talks in India and abroad. He is also associate professor of AC, SIR India and recipient of Young Scientist Award from Material Research Society of India in 2006. He also recipient of prestigious senior member award from Optical Society of America, USA uh, in 2020. So today he is going to talk us about, and his title talk, delivered a talk entitled, An Overview of Specialty Optical Fiber, from fabrication to high-end application. What do you, sir? Mm, so we can go ahead with your talk. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just let me share my slide first. Is the slide visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. It's okay. First of all, uh, thank you to organizer uh, for inviting me for this particular workshop. So what I will actually go through, rather uh, an overview of specialty optical fiber, uh, from fabrication to high-end application. So my target is to just give you some idea how this optical fiber is prepared and where this optical fiber is used beyond the general application in telecommunication. So it will consist of the definitions of optical fibers, how it works, the different types of optical fiber. Then in terms of fabrication, we will learn what are the materials requirement? How this preform is prepared from which fiber is drawn? Then the different fiber parameters and their characterization. And of course, the application of specialty optical fiber, where I will show the work of CGCRI uh, in this particular aspect. So going into the first, what is optical fiber? All of you know this optical fiber is a 
actually waveguide, cylindrical waveguide made up of extremely pure silica and light actually transmit to the transparent fiber by wave motion. So if we see this particular picture, this is an ACN image of optical fiber, where this is an image of human hair. So if we compare our optical fiber is just little bit thicker compared to our human hair. So our human hair is around 80 micron, where the fiber dimension is 125 micron. And if it is coated, it will be 250 micron. So how this optical fiber with this small dimension can carry this light? So the basic structure of optical fiber actually leads to these particular things. So it consists of its core, then followed by the cladding, and then we have a coating. So the core actually carries the light and the cladding keeps the light in the core and the coating gives us the mechanical strength. If we see this particular picture, this is called the refractive index profile. So it clearly shows that the core has the higher refractive index compared to the cladding. So the light propagates through optical fiber to well-known total internal reflection. Now coming into the uh, comparison of optical fiber, why this optical fiber is important? Why not this copper cable survive our purpose? So this optical fiber has several advantage compared to the copper cable. In terms of information carrying capacity, the speed and the distance what we can cover with the optical fiber is much better than copper cable. The security is most important. That is also better in optical fiber. The immunity towards the electromagnetic field is another advantage. And in terms of design, it is lightweight, thin, and mostly durable. And in terms of cost, it is a little bit costlier compared to copper cable. But compared to the other advantage, optical fiber is nowadays replaces almost everywhere the copper cable. Now, one actually important thing comes in our mind. What is the difference between this optical fiber communication and the wireless communication? So we prefer that sometimes this wireless communication is better compared to the optical fiber system. But if we see the comparison, the optical fiber provide you the high data rate, long distance, one connection per system, but it is static lens. So expensive in terms of installation. Whereas this wireless system is actually having low data rates, short distance, but it would shared connection. So limiting, is the regulation and the crosstalk problem. So it enables the mobility and easy flexibility during installation. So in terms of comparing this optical fiber with the wireless communi communication, what we can say that optical fiber uh, actually lacks the mobility while the communication system through wireless is much more better. So, but unfortunately, the data things is higher in case of optical fiber, as you can see, with times this data rate is increasing thanks to the optical fiber. So, actually, we need to hold the thing that is optical fiber and the wireless simultaneously. So, this how fiber works in the communication. This is a simple structure. It explains how the fiber works in communication. So, first, what happens? the electrical signal is introduced, which actually encodes the data for going through the fiber. Then after light is introduced into the optical fiber, light is obviously going to get some losses, which is called the transmission losses. And it comes to this detector end, and it is converted to the electrical signal again, which is amplified and fed to the another detector that produces the final electrical signal. So this is how this optical fiber works in communication. Now I'll go through a brief history of optical fiber, which starts in 10.1015 with the publication of the first book in optics by al -Hassan. Then the first experiment was done by the Collard in 1842 that proves that light can travel using the total internal reflection. Based on that, Heinrich Lamb in 1930 prepared the first fiber optic endoscope. Then in 1954, we are proud that Professor Narendra Kapani showed that light can travel in the bane glass fiber. Then 
in maiman in 1961 first invented the laser which followed by the ground breaking research by the professor charles cow which predicted that silica could be a material to produce the low loss optical fiber based on his communication in 1970 these three musketeers professor cake morar and sulj fabricated the first low loss silica optical fiber in corning then in 1986 the specialty optical fiber began with the demonstration of the first rbm dot fiber amplifier by professor david pen i am lucky that i have worked with him uh, then in 1996 the new uh, fibers which is now coming very rapidly for this communication system is photonic crystal fiber shown by the professor rasen now what are the different types of optical fiber very simply we can divide it into the three categories the one is the step index single mode fiber through which only one particular mode can propagate another is the step index multi mode fiber through which we can propagate many modes and then another is the green fiber so what are the application so very simply we can divide it into two category the single mode fiber will be used for uh just one to one communication whereas the multi mode fiber can gives you multiple uh, communication from one place but this is not the only end of the types of optical fiber it could be divided based on the waveguide structure as well as the based on the material so based on the waveguide structure i have already discussed but the based on the material it can be divided into two categories one is non silica based which could be divided into oxide glass and non oxide glass like telluride germanate phosphate and in term, terms of non oxide glasses it could be chalcogenide halide polymer beside that we could have different fibers in terms of crystal or semiconductor the semiconductor optical fiber is a recent development in terms of optical fiber obviously the based on material silica is the best one i will come very quickly there now before that what is specialty optical fiber which is actually the topics of my today's lecture so the, it is nothing but some differentiation from that of the sing, standard single mode or multi mode fiber to achieve some specific properties which is not possible in case of standard telecommunication fiber to achieve that what we need to do we need to change the waveguide structure and we need to introduce some dopant with the spe uh, specific purpose to emit uh, at a particular wavelength region so what you can say that its requirement is small but its impact is huge you can find this information that the specialty optical fiber market is huge although it is very very small requirement it requires only a few centimeter to about 30 meters maximum but you can see it will have the market around 2130.8 million by 2031 with a compound annual growth rate of 7.3% now let's see the different types of specialty optical fiber what are the different types of specialty optical fiber we could have you can see there are various types it could be photonic crystal fiber it could be polarization maintaining fiber it could be radiation hard fiber high index fiber semiconductor core optical fiber rare earth rock fiber bend insensitive fiber photosensitive fiber so what i can say this is uh, not ending here there could be various other applications other types of structure which i have not able to accommodate in this particular slide but as i already said this require very very small uh, amount Uh, in terms of length, but it's very costly. So coming into the fabrication aspect. So before going into the fabrication things, one should know what are the characteristics of a material that can be converted into the fiber. So there are actually five characteristics. Most important thing is that it should be temperature stable. Otherwise, we we could not process it. in terms of chemical properties it should be durable and non toxic so that we can handle it low transmission loss is one of the important criteria 
and it should provide us the reliability in terms of strength. And finally, in terms of uh, cost and the availability, what we can find, there are various possibilities. You can see it could be silica, chalcogenite, telluride, fluoride, polymer, crystal, semiconductor. And you can find this, the different composition and the operating zone. But if you see in this transmission losses, what you can find, this is having the minimum losses and we know that this is our actually telecommunication wavelength. So undoubtedly the silica found to be the best material until now for making of specialty optical fiber. I mean, although you can ask me that these are not used. Yes, these are used, but these are used for some specific application and still not properly developed. Coming into the uh, history of silica glass fiber, you can see it has been started since 3000 BC. But what we can find, the loss of the glass was very, very high. So people has tried to reduce the loss with time, but the breaking of this thing happens in 1966 when Professor Charles Kau theoretically predicted that it is possible to reduce the loss of optical fiber around 20 dB per kilometer. As soon as it produ uh, reported, then as I already showed that three musketeers in Corning lab has produced the optical fiber with low losses. And now very, very recent uh, optical fiber is found to be uh, having the loss of 0.12 dB per kilometer by in, uh, NTT corporation in Japan. So this specialty optical fiber or the silica based optical fiber can be used in the three windows. The past window was initially used in uh, time of 1970 to 1980, but this has been discarded later on as we find this 1.2 micron window that is the 1.3 rather is much better with lower losses. But finally, we have stick to the third window, which actually produces the minimum losses. So practically, whatever the optical communication or whatever the optical uh, uh, properties we are now getting is because of this low loss of silica at this third window. So what is the basic structure of a silica? This is the silica structure. That is one silica is attached with the four oxygen. Atoms. So this is the basic unit of silica glass. But this is not the proper structure of a glass because it is a crystalline nature. So what we need, we need this amorphous structure and that needs the breaking of the network. So this breaking of the network actually leads to the creation of some non-bridging oxygen. These are the non-bridging oxygen you can see. So this non-bridging oxygen is essential to introduce some other dopant, which is essential for the specialty optical fiber. So what we can use? No, here you can use all the periodic tables. The different elements can used, uh, can be doped into the optical fiber at different extent to open up the glass structure and to get the different applications. So now let's see how this fabrication of specialty optical fiber takes place. So you can see, this is a schematic diagram where we have this silica, germanium, phosphorus, and the boron. These are the liquid precursor where the oxygen gas is bubbled and this oxygen will carry out to the tube, which is heated by this oxyhydrogen burner from outside. And this is the pyrometer which will actually take up the temperature, the outside temperature. So it will deposit it. Now, how this deposition will take place? Now, this will take place in the modified chemical vapor deposition system that is called MCVD system. I will show you a shortly video, then you can understand how it's actually taking place. But this preform fabrication is actually divided into main three stages. One is the cladding glass formation, then the core glass followed by the collapsing. So the cladding glass is actually composed of either pure silica or silica doped with the fluorone, fluorine or boron which can reduces the refractive index compared to silicon. But since we have the core, which need to be higher refractive index, we can dope some other elements like germanium, phosphorus, aluminum, rare earth, etc. 
what the reaction actually going on it's a very basic reaction so this uh, halide precursor is get oxidized to produce corresponding oxide those are actually deposited first and after that when this burner is passed over that it will convert it into the corresponding uh, uh, <coughs> smooth layer which then collapse to give you the final preform okay but you may think of that why uh, this process is using there is no mention of some other dopants like the rare earth which is used for the specialty optical fiber yes that is true and that's why actually we need to adopt some other process the one such process is called the solution doping process so here it's again starts in the sensitivity uh, system but instead of high temperature we use lower temperature to deposit this porous cold layer and then we cut the tube and then we impregnate with the solution containing aluminum and the rare earth salt so what we can see that this porous structure is looks like this so when this porous structure is impregnated uh, during the solution doping it will just actually fill up this pores with this rare earth and the aluminum and when after that drying of this layer, we sintered it, we will get this sintered soap layer followed by the collapsing of the tube to get the final prefer. Okay. Now, then there is another system is required. So, you may think that why already you have talked about two system, why the third system is required? No, actually in case of laser fiber, we require the larger code dimension. So, in case of this larger code dimension, we are Un, uh, we are unable to do it through this solution doping technique uh, as if I just go back, this non-uniformity, this porous structure is non-uniform. If you can see, this has non-uniformity. So if this non-uniformity non remains, what will happen that along the length of the fiber, the performance will not be very good. So to avoid that, we have this particular system introduced this is called the MCBT coupled with the vapor phase chelate delivery technique. So here you have additional aluminum salt and the rare earth salt, which you can actually introduce along with the silica and germania to get the deposition continuously. So you can increase your cold layer as far as your requirement. Now let us see uh, after the fiber fabrication, uh, preform fabrication, it undergoes the fiber drawing. So what is fiber drawing? Fiber drawing is nothing but you can just consider one uh, thicker rod is giving you a thinner rod of particular dimension. So here the preform is fed into the furnace. After that, it actually uh, comes out through this particular region due to the gravity at a particular temperature around 1800 degrees centigrade. Then we actually monitor the dimension followed by coating of the uh, bare fiber with the polymer and then we actually cured it and uh, rewind it. So let's see how this fiber fabrication is actually uh, going on. Yes, sir. Is yeah. it okay? No. Yeah, I we got disconnected actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just let me uh, play this video. I don't know. Uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So this is due to some uh, uh, connection issue. Uh, suddenly it is off. So uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, madam? Uh, I, am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, sir, playing a video. So. Okay. So, sir, please continue. I think uh, our participants are also in the meeting. So, sir, please continue. Yeah, just a minute. I'll just. I will play it from outside, no issue. Uh... Yeah. 
can you see it yes sir yes sir it is visible yes sir it is visible yeah so you can see this is actually the mcbd system and this is actually the tube which is going to convert into your preform state sir i i couldn't see any video which is playing in uh, this slide ppt i can see ppt okay, uh, that i can see Just uh, now you can see this. Yes, sir. Now. Okay, so uh, this is the actually MCBD system setup. So here we have the silica glass tube, which is heated from this oxyhydrogen burner by outside, and it is continuously rotating. So here is some program we have made for making this preform, and you can see this is the actual tube from where uh, we are finally getting the preform. So the gases are coming from this end to this, and it is this burner going from this side to this side. So after uh, we actually first flame polish it, that means the tube is first heated, then the deposition is takes place. You can see some reaction is occurring here and the deposition is taking place in the front of this tube. Now again, this burner is moving from this end to this end. And in this way, the several number of steps are going on. First, we need to deposit the uh, cladding layer of pure silica or sometimes doped with the silica with the chlorine. And then we need to deposit the cold layer. Now, after this deposition is finished, then the last step that is the collapsing. You can see this two line. This two line is actually nothing but the finally they will actually march to get you the cold layer. This outside layer are cladding and this line will be collapsed to give you the final cold layer. Probably you can see that this layer is coming very closer to each other and now finally they will seal and then it is giving you the cold layer. So this is the white layer which you can find in the middle is your cold layer. So in this way, actually the preform collapsing is carried out. So after we complete this collapsing stage, then we'll get the final preform After that, we go for the fiber drawing. So you can see this fiber drawing furnace. So from here, the fiber is actually coming out with a very, very fine dimension. So it's entering into the laser monitor and then go through this part. You can find the very fine fibers. Okay, so this is how actually the fiber drawing uh, takes place. Now I am going back to again share my presentation. So where I left. Okay. So uh, sir, uh, one yeah. thing. Oh, at Hello. We all got disconnected. So the now host ship is in your account. Can you please uh, make me host? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are some technical. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. 
so uh now the next uh, one specialty optical fiber which we are uh, doing in our revision is called the photonic crystal fiber or the pca so this is a conventional fiber and this is a structure of a pca so what is consist of it consist of some holes air holes and sometimes the silica rod in the central so this is somehow different from the mcbd process and it's called the stack and draw technique so here first we stack the different capillaries and then we actually draw it to the fiber and this particular speciality optical fiber is used for generation of white light source or the supercontinuum source which can range from 400 to say 2400 or even more than that so it have this single mode behavior over a wide band of wavelength and can produce the high energy okay uh, coming into the important parameters of an optical fiber. So what are the important parameters one should look into the uh, fiber? So it at the core clad dimension, the numerical aperture, attenuation, V number, dispersion and bandwidth. I will discuss the first three in more details in the next slide. But the V number is a very important parameter which actually gives you some idea whether the fiber will uh, shows the single mode behavior or the multi-mode behavior. And in case of dispersion, it is very important because it's actually a spreading out of the light pulse. So it uh, degrades the fiber uh, performance rather. So we need to reduce this dispersion as much as possible. But of course, this bandwidth is need to be increased. So coming into the core clad dimension. So to uh, see this core clad dimension, one need to actually remove the polymer coating, clip the fiber properly, and place under the microscope to get the portlet dimension. You can see these two pictures. One is for the single mode fiber and another is the multi-mode fiber of the dimension of this type of string. Coming into the numerical aperture. What is the numerical aperture? No, it is actually the ability of an optical fiber to collect the incident light. So it depends on the difference between the refractive index of the core and the clad. So we actually need to measure the refractive index for the preform stage at the preform stage as well as at the fiber stage. So how this preform analyzer works? So we have a, actually uh, this, uh, you can see uh, this uh, oil tank and this is a laser light. So the preform goes inside this and after that it actually rotate until it get equilibrium. Then the laser light originate and then laser light falls into the preform and then refracted back to produce this refractive index profile. So how this is actually happening is actually measure the voltages of the deflected light. And uh, with this particular formula through the software, it is converted into the refractive index profile. Coming into the fiber analyzer, the fiber analy analyzer actually performed the measurement in terms of refracted near field measurement. So this is how this is done. So the light again comes to the fiber tip and then the refract refracted light is collected by the detector and then converted into the corresponding formula to get this refractive index profile. Now, uh, coming into the loss in optical fiber. So where from this losses in optical fiber comes? So there are various issues. It could be from absorption. That can be from impurities or intrinsic. Then we can have the radiation losses from micro bending or the macro bending when we are working with the fiber, then the Rayleigh scattering, which is an inherent property of the glass that could be due to the variation in concentration of the dopant or the variation in density, imperfection, which may occur during the fabrication, which comes from the bubbles generation, cracks generation, or the inclusion, or the waveguide imperfection, which can result due to the core guide imperfection. So now how this uh, loss is measured. So to measure the loss, we actually have this white light source that actually go through this chopper, which actually modulate the input light intensity. Then through the monochromator, light is launched into the fiber. And then the fiber actually uh, gives you the transmission. This transmission goes to the locking amplifier. And then uh, through some mechanism, it comes into the uh, display which gives you the particular uh, loss attenuation curve and this through this particular curve this particular 
losses of the fiber can be calculated as well as if it is doped with the rare earth or other dopant, they have particularly uh, absorption at a particular wavelength. From that, you can also calculate the dopant incorporation amount. Okay, so with this, uh, we can go to the rare earth dope fiber amplifier. So as I told that, uh, we will discuss about the high end applications. So one of this application is the amplifier. So rare earth dope fiber amplifier can be used in uh, optical fiber communication as a repeaters to avoid the electrical uh, amplification and to increase the signal level in CATV application. And it has a, also a very good market. So it will be 1.8 billion by 2031. And you can use different rare earth to get emission at the different wavelength. But the most important amplifier is your RBM dope. So how this optical amplifier works, you know, first a pump light comes, which in, uh, actually excited the light uh, in electron to the higher excited state, then it comes to metastable state. And when it comes back, the light is actually amplified. So why RBM is mostly used? Because this RBM has the very high level of lifetime around the millisecond, then it shows no excited state absorption and high quantum efficiency and noise speaker is also very good. With that, the problem is that this rare earth solubility, that means the RBM solubility is a problem and greater than 100 ppm, what it will happen that two rare earth come seed by seed, which is called the rare earth clustering. To avoid that, we need to introduce some dopants like aluminum, phosphorus, and that has been already discussed previously. So the MCBD solution- Sir, uh yeah excuse me sir sorry for the interruption actually right now you are the host of this meeting due to the technical fault we got all got uh, disconnected so can you make me host uh, how can i do that just can you yeah, suggest me uh, how to do that sir if you see the parties please there yeah. you can see one drop down so okay uh yeah. Uh, so uh, I can find uh, you, but uh, how can mm -hmm. you make it? Uh, uh, at the right side, if you come at the right side, you can get the option. After the video options, video uh, symbol, to so the video some symbol, you can see three dots and there you can see uh, drop down yeah make host yes is it yes. okay now okay. okay thank you sir thank you yes sir, yes, sir. thank you sir. okay yes uh, sir uh, sorry for this <laughs> anyway uh, so now, uh, if you see that the cost of this RBM dot fiber is quite uh, high compared to the conventional fiber, and this is because of what you can see uh, previously due to the non-uniformity of the pura structure, which actually requires several number of preform runs to get a particular good fiber to achieve the performance required. So CGCRI is actually working in this particular aspect and they have developed the RBM root fiber, which has been packaged with the Nest, uh, our industry partner, uh, to actually uh, produce this uh, optical amplifier, which has been commercialized uh, in 2017. Now coming into the optical fiber laser. So what is this optical fiber laser? We all know this laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation which has uh, important properties like monochromatic nature, coherence, directionality, and sharp focus. But the gain medium could be solid, liquid, gas, and advantage uh, in terms of these three uh, medium, the fiber laser could give you the high stability, excellent beam quality, better efficiency, and minimum thermal impairment. So based on that, the laser could have the various application uh, starting from industrial, medical, and strategic sector. It could be marking, scribing, cutting, drilling, surgery, and directed energy weapon, leader, etc. So coming into uh, the different types of laser, 
the different wavelength could be achieved using the different rear act. But the most important one is the ytterbium, which could produce emission at one micron. And that can give you the power level from milliwatt to the hundreds of kilowatt. So the, again, the market, if you see, it is huge, 8.42 billion by 2030. So why this ytterbium is selected? Now, the reason is that it has the simplest energy level. It could have very high absorption and emission cross-section low quantum defects and high lifetime. So with this, if we see the particular laser structure, that is uh, laser building structure. So the basic structure consists of the four components. One is the pump drive, the active fiber, the combiner, which combines the pump uh, diode, uh, pump laser into the core of the optical fiber and the PR of grating. In CGCRI, we are actually working in all this part except this pump diode. And with that, I'll just go through the basics of this fiber structure. So we have the large palm diode. Uh, um, so it gives you the multi-mode structure. I'm, I don't know what is actually happening. Can you see some uh, scratches in the slides? Yes, sir. Yeah. OK. So, uh, so the light is uh, coming into the, actually uh, going into the cladding, but you can see the code is very small. So how this light will interact? So we need to have this double clad concept. So what is double clad concept? Now in this double clad concept, the cladding layer is to be coated with the low index polymer so that the uh, light will actually get total internal reflection from the cladding itself. And it should also interact with the core material. But what we find in case of the uh, circular geometry, it does not happen properly. So the people has find that the breaking of the cylindrical symmetry can increase the pump light. So with that, the different uh, structure has been proposed. And finally, what people have accepted is the octagonal shape structure or the hexagonal shape structure. So here is the octagonal shape preform fabricated at CGCRI. And this is the fiber from which actually we have developed the laser of different applications. So this is the ytterbium dot pulse laser for marking and engraving. And this is the laser for the stain cutting. Uh, sorry, I do not know whether it will work. Yes. Uh, uh, can you see this video? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. Uh, actually, the CGCRI made a uh, fiber laser based system which is used for the marking one. So, this marking is okay. Yeah. So, I'm stopping this one, and here you can see this is the cutting. So, this has been recently uh, tested in one of our industrial partners. <coughs> so this is the cutting of thick metal sheet so again the next uh, application could be the use of the thulium fiber which is suitable for the two micron applications so because this has the strong absorption near two micron it can reduce the penetration depth if it is used for the uh, surgery. Then the substantial heating uh, during this operation will be minimized and that gives you the precise cutting and the less bleeding and the minimal damage around the exposed area. But it requires some specific criteria to achieve this particular structure, which is called as the cross relaxation technique. I'm not going into the details of this, but the simple thing is that when you pump a particular uh, electron, it should give you the two electron at the high excited state and the uh, metastable state, and then the pump light will be much more higher. So that is the particular thing related to cross relaxation process. So CGCRI uh, has actually working on this particular thing. So one of my colleague, Dr. Atoshi Pal is working on this particular uh, things. So we have developed this uh, thulium fiber laser. This is a kidney stone 
which is actually broke down into these pieces. So just let me see to be, uh, show you this thing. So this is actually kidney stone. So this is now how it is breaking. Just see this video. This is all made in CGCRI. So you can see that uh, this particular laser is coming into this stone. It is now breaking down. And this water is actually trying to go through this particular channel. So which is equivalent to the channel in our human system. And you can see this average fragmentation rate is around 30 mi uh, milligram per minute and the particle size is around 100 micron. So finally, it goes very, very small and it can go through this channel. Okay. Okay, so uh, now I'll just go briefly, uh, very quickly through the other applications where the specialty optical fiber is required. Of course, one is the information distribution. As we know that all we are facing some problem with the bandwidth. So now the people are trying to increase the bandwidth, but that requires specialty optical fiber or special design. Then we need this all optical network. So where actually we can avoid the electrical electronic processing that again requires the specific optical fiber then of course the fttih is now very well known uh, for our applications now coming into the medical industry we could have this endoscope why because the fiber is flexible and easy to bend and already we have seen that surgery in surgery it is very important because it can provide you the perfect beam and the less peripheral damage in dentistry, it could offer the precision and the efficiency which can be achieved only by this fiber laser. In terms of defense applications, yeah, we can have this leader communication detection with precision that can actually cover all the say one to five kilometer of range. Then the laser based weapon where the CGCR is actually working with in supports of the DRDO to develop the fiber component, fiber and fiber based component for their systems. And then the border security system, we could have this fiber optic distributed sensor and CGCR is actually working in another field where we are developing some specialty optical fiber, which is used for the hydro, uh, uh, used in the uh, hydrophone in the uh, undersea applications. Coming into the industrial application, as you already see that the cutting, which can gives you the precise, faster, less power consumption, engraving, already I have shown some pictures which we have done with our uh, system and the drilling of any whole size. Just see one video, how this cutting works with the fiber laser. Okay, so finally, we could have some other application as well. So of course, we knew the use of the laser printer, then the laser barcode reading, now laser tattoo removal, then the genes and the underwater imaging. I know you are probably thinking of the genes, how this is associated with the optical fiber. So let's see how this is associated with the optical fiber. So this is the optical fiber based uh, laser, which is used actually to make these wash genes. Okay, so finally, it's time to acknowledge. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our director, ma'am, and our HOD, Dr. Shumnat Bandapadhyay. Then I would like to thank my students, PhD student Nilot Paul, Dipanjan, Shoival, and Vishnu, 
the funding agency csr drdo and the dst and my foreign collaborator professor frank wise from cornell university simon fleming from sydney university professor dave richardson from southampton who has recently joined the microsoft professor shahu from southampton university and professor ivan kasi from czech republic so finally uh, thank all of you and i would like to conclude with this particular things which is of one of my favorite uh, things that is dream transform into thoughts and thoughts results in action so we should dream and con try to convert it into the actual uh, <coughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dhar, for your very nice and wonderful talk. It is so transparent and it makes us a journey, approximately 180 years of journey of the development of optical fiber. And it is very nice to know that our own CDCRI in India developing all these cutting edge technologies. Uh, thank you so much. Now, if is there any question, Papia, then we can take one or two questions. Chat box, uh, at this moment, no question. So students or anyone, if you want to ask something directly to our speaker. Uh, yeah, hi, I, yes. I have one question. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, so, sir. yeah, so. Uh, mm. Yeah, I just want to ask you when you say mode, like the multi mode or graded mode. So, what do you mean by mode? Like in in the in the research domain, what do you mean by mode of the yeah, fiber? So could you please explain it? Like, yeah, in a simple word, uh, not going into the much more details. The mode is actually the information, the light information. So, the mode single mode means you can transform a uh, one particular types of light signal that means the one information can carry through the fiber because of its tolerance so it will be called the single mode but when you require the various types of uh, information need to be transformed equally uh, then you need this multi mode so that means the light uh, in entrance into the single mode fiber is restricted to provide you the transmission of particularly one uh, property, uh, one information, and in case of the multi-mode, it is various information at a time. And in terms of uh, your this multi-mode fiber, actually, uh, wherever we are working in the bandwidth things, it is always the multi-mode one. So it is a very, uh, without any mathematics, I am telling you, uh, because if I just want to go into the details, I need to do some maths uh, and show you this, what is the single mode and the multi-mode one. <coughs> Uh, now it's it's clearer to me. Thank you. And uh, one more question I have. So one of your slides where you have uh, shown the modes. So they are for that uh, graded index mode, like this called Grim, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there, uh, like the uh, the slide shows that the light is going like a sine wave, uh, wavy pattern like uh, way. So why is that? Like why it's kind of a sine wave kind of structure while the uh, other modes are uh, i think it's not like the sine waves like a straight line or something uh, reflection kind of thing so why it's like uh, that yeah you are talking about this slide yes okay. yes yes yes, yes. Yeah. yeah so it's it's just uh, it's just actually representation it does not means that oh. it is always will be into sine wave mode it's just representation just as a uh, presentation things oh okay it's it's nothing with this uh, particular sine wave things. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there any question? Any more question? Anyone? Yes, anyone from students? Yeah. Okay, so definitely you may write me or you then I can convey your questions to anyone sir. Hope sir will be happy to answer you. To yes, reply. of course. Of course, you can uh, forward me the question uh, through email. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as I already told that uh, they can also write to me in my email ID. Directly, ID. yeah. Yeah, Directly. do you have some question or this thing? Sir, so, I have, I have just... Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. No. Sorry. Sorry. 
Please continue, uh, sir. Uh, Onirban, sir, can I uh, ask one question? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, this is actually not uh, related to subject. Uh, I have found that you have shown several experimental demonstration and it is very nice. Uh, can you can you just uh, speak loud? Uh, hello, sir. I am audible now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the thing is that we have found some very beautiful experimental demonstration from your lab. Uh, so I am just uh, asking, uh, that is just a request. Is it possible for uh, us to visit one day uh, in your lab and uh, see the experiment sometime? Uh, uh, yes, uh, of course it is possible. Uh, but uh, I, I know that uh, your HUD ma'am will of course take uh, <laughs> care of this thing. Mm -hmm. And actually it need to uh, approach to proper- Proper also, channel. Proper yeah. channel. So proper yeah. channel of course possible but only thing is that uh, whatever the experiment uh, that is the video i have shown you mm -hmm. maybe uh, all those things uh, live demonstration may not uh, always possible because you know that this laser is working at high power level and we cannot uh, show all these things to all the exhibitor huh? okay sir okay. maybe you can see that how this fiber is preparing how this characterization is going on so all these thing is uh, possible Ah, okay. In principle, you can also see the basic structure and this thing, but this uh, laser demonstration uh, or this uh, uh, grating demonstration, I have not actually covered the grating one, the sensor part, because I know the time is uh, short, so I have not covered the demo, uh, this fiber sensor part. But of course, if you come and uh, we could talk with our HOD, so you can see the fiber sensor demonstration, because it is much more easier to much show more. this one. Okay. okay, sir. Okay, sir. So in near future, I think uh, maybe Papia Madam will communicate uh, and uh, if it is possible, we yes. can visit with our students. It will be it will be great opportunity for us for to, our, actually, for to our. see this uh, manufacturing process of PCM. Yeah. Sir, uh, just one query, small yeah. query, that already, I mean, researchers are doing uh, various research on photonic crystal structure right now. Right. And uh, some techniques are there in SPR digital finding different noble metals or the plasmonic uh, material over this core region. Yeah. Theoretically, they are uh, designing this. So, how much it is possible that uh, we can can you fabricate it within um, within the photo photonic crystal fiber? This kind of two layer or three layer uh, design within PCA? Yeah, it's a very good question actually. And uh, here there is a uh, actually competition between the theoretician and the practical things. So the theoretically it is all possible that we can fabricate uh, two layers, three layers of metal, these things. But I can tell you even uh, just uh, incorporate one particular layer inside the core of this PCF is very difficult. One of my colleague, Dr. Devosri Ghosh is actually working uh, in this particular aspect. So we are also trying to uh, dope with uh, different types of metal, but frankly speaking, it is very difficult because you are actually drawing the fiber at high temperature around say 2000 degree centigrade. At that temperature, the, all the metals are getting vaporized. So people, instead of that, actually what showed is uh, the, using the different types of gas encapsulated into the cores of PCFs, the, the holes of the PCF. So that is much more easier compared to the metal one. But I'm not telling that it is not uh, possible. Of course, as to me, the one uh, metal coating is possible, but that requires some special drawing technique. And as far as my knowledge, uh, one report is already there. This practical report is there uh, with this metal coated. And they have actually tried this uh, uh, silver coated uh, PCA uh, because you know that silver is better for the plasmonic application compared to the gold. So the silver coating uh, in PCF has already been done. But uh, another information which I am getting it, uh, I should not uh, say the source of this thing because it is a from a company. So this company is actually working with this PCF and they have actually fabricated a very short piece of uh, PCF uh, with the metal coated one. Uh, but uh, Unfortunately, these are still in the R&D stage, what I can say. Okay. So, uh, I, I think there is no more question. 
So if not, let yeah. us thank uh, Dr. Dhar again for his very nice talk. So thank you so much for making time for us. Yeah. And and we are looking forward you, to, to visit our campus. We hope you'll deliver talk in our campus coming personally sometimes in future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was so, really very crystal clear presentation and yeah. information was really good. So I think students enjoyed it, everyone like me. <laughs> So yeah, so we are with this, we come to the end of the first session of this seminar. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Operajita Madam. It was uh, it was really nice experience uh, for us. Uh, uh, how sir has demonstrated their field and you have shared the session nicely thank you so much ma'am thank you thank now you so now uh, we are uh, uh, dr somna chatterjee uh, sir are you here okay yes i'm here okay okay sir you can get my voice so now yes, yes sir yes sir you are audible. so uh i would like to start uh, uh the session uh to second session of day one and i would like to introduce our session chair dr shomna chatterjee sir he, now uh he is working as professor in a uh, department of physics sobos adamas university uh, he has uh completed his PhD from uh, IIT Kharagpur and MSc from Vita Shagar University. His research area is nanomaterial synthesis and characterization. And he has also worked in the different field like solar cell, graphene-based sensor, and nanoelectronics as well. He has uh, numbers of publications in International Journal 75, and more than 50 international conferences. So within this stipulated time, I can just uh, say solution in the field of science. So uh, now, sir, over to you to continue the session two of day one. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Dhara, for a nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, we will start the new session, that is the second session of the first day YPM 2023. And uh, here, uh, I'm just introducing the first uh, the speaker, uh, Nobukuma Rana, Senior Research Fellow from University of Kolkata. And his topic is Improvement of Thermoelectric Properties by Tuning annealing temperature of Bismarck telluride system. So, uh, Mr. Rana, you have the 15 minutes time to uh, there, I think 13 plus two, that will be better because the other speakers are there also. So please, uh, you can share your screen and start your lecture. Okay, sir. Can you show me your title slide was okay? Thank you. Okay, is it visible? Yeah, you can make F5. So that it will be press F5. Okay. Okay, great. Is it okay? Yeah, you can start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself Novakumar Rana. I am from Department of Physics, University of Calcutta. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank 
uh, uh, Adamas University for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, today, now my title of the talk is Improvement of Thermoelectric Properties by Tuning Aniline Temperature of Bismuth Red System. So our uh, research mainly uh, in the field of energy harvesting uh, through thermoelectric technology. So now, uh, world is facing uh, a crisis of sustainable energy supply due to reduction in fossil fuel and natural gas. So uh, there is some uh, uh, issue, energy related issue. Now in power plant, automobile sector industries, most of the energy around 66% uh, energy are wasted as heat distribution. Only 34% are used. So if this wasted heat, heat can be recovered, then it will be very beneficial for this modern civilization. So what is the solution? One of the solution is thermoelectric technology. So by using thermoelectric material, we can retrieve this waste heat into usable energy. Uh, and um, our main motto is to uh, improve the thermoelectric efficiency of a material. So uh, the efficiency of thermoelectric material uh, is, uh, is designated by uh, a parameter, okay, which is uh, uh, ZD. Now, what is thermoelectric material? At first, uh, I would like to introduce thermoelectric material, which is uh, capable to convert heat into electrical energy and vice versa. There is lot of advantage and dis the advantages like it can recycle waste heat energy there is no moving parts so it is maintenance free high reliable low noise and it is compact and less weight however the if it's converts as efficiency up to now is very low to be applicable in daily life now the conversion efficiency of a thermoelectric material as i said earlier is designated by a parameter zd which is called figure of merit Figure of merit ZD equal to S square sigma by kappa into T, where S is Seebeck coefficient or thermo power. Sigma is electrical conductivity, kappa is thermal conductivity. And the thermal conductivity consists of two parts, electronic parts and lattice parts. So for an efficient thermoelectric material, ZD should be high. So uh, high power factor and low thermal conductivity uh, is needed uh, for a efficient thermoelectric material. And uh, the thermoelectric parameter is that is thermal power or CV coefficient and sigma electrical conductivity and thermal uh, thermal conductivity are uh, like this. Uh, this is the equation equations where we can see here that all the parameters are interconnected interconnected through uh, n that is carrier concentration. In two thousand eight, Snyder Group has reported that uh, thermoelectric property uh, is uh, high in this region that is carrier concentration between 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 20 per centimeter cube uh, then uh, the zd is high so uh, what uh, so a semiconductor has uh, range, this uh, range of carrier concentration now our system is bi2 t3 which is a well known type and n-type thermoelectric material around room temperature. It consists both bismuth and tellurium, which are heavy metal, and it is a narrow band gap semiconductor. And it has large structure and isotropy. Uh, also, it is known as 3D topological insulator. So uh, I we have uh, synthesized Bi2 T3 material through solid state reaction method uh, by two different ways. Uh, these are the schematic diagram of heat heat treatment. Uh, the two sample S1 and S2. For sample S1, uh, the annealing temperature is 550, and for S2, annealing temperature is 480 degrees centigrade. So after synthesis, this sample we have performed XRD at first in our lab source. Then we have performed singleton XRD. Uh, this is the uh, XRD spectra at a room temperature. Uh, this XRD spectra shows that all the sim samples are single phase in nature. And 
the peaks indicates rhomboidal crystal structure of bi2 t3 having r3 bar m space group and we have uh, extracted the lattice parameter and cell volume from temperature dependent uh, data of synchrotron xrd by using revealed refinement method using mod this is uh, the lattice parameter where we can see that lattice parameter and cell volume increases with the increasing annealing temperature and uh, here we can see also that uh, that for the sample s2 uh, okay let me pointer for the sample s2 the volume is decreases uh, that is uh, there is some compression in the uh, lattice uh, then we have uh, studied raman spectroscopy mm, uh, raman spectroscopy uh, in room temperature and temperature dependent from 77 kelvin to 30 kel 300 kelvin for the two samples here uh, these are the raman spectroscopy and in the inset we can see that uh, for the middle that is easy to mode uh, there is a right shift that is blue shift in the material uh, this is uh, due to uh, compressive strain as we have seen earlier in xrd data and uh, uh, from the temperature dependent raman spectra we uh, we got the spectra and fitted it with uh, lorentz function then we extracted uh, the peak position and fwhm then uh, we have uh, fitted the uh, peak position that is uh, uh, raman frequency with this equation uh, and then we have uh, ex we have calculated the lattice thermal conductivity pt from raman spectroscopy by using this equation where uh, this is delta omega delta omega is the shift due to change in temperature uh, delta t in the sample and uh, delta b is the change in power of the incident laser source uh, this r is the the instrument parameter so uh, uh, now uh, this is the comparative table where uh, it can be seen that uh, the for two samples uh, we have measured to, uh, lattice thermal conductivity coupled from ppms data and raman data and which is which are nearly uh, same uh, we have performed carrier concentration and from carrier concentration uh, by using resistivity we uh, obtained mobility of the samples you can see here that carrier concentration for 480 degree centigrade sample decreased and mobility is increased this change in carrier concentration and mobility uh, uh, can explain the transport property of the material we can we will see it later uh, we have performed resistivity and thermal power in our own lab setup uh, we can see that the resistivity of the sample it increases with temperature which is uh, the metallic nature of our sample both samples shows this nature and annealing at 480 degree centigrade uh, the resistivity becomes high which can be explained by a carrier concentration and also uh, in the, in the introduction of point defect uh, these are the thermal power data uh, uh, here we have uh, performed thermal power from 15 kelvin to 300 kelvin in our lab and we can see that the thermal power is value is negative the negative value of cv coefficient or thermal power which indicates uh, n type nature of the sample and uh, cv coefficient in increase is increasing by lowering the annealing temperature so this significant change in annealing temperature is due to band convergence effect so to justify the band convergence the effect of <clears throat> to justify the band convergence we have uh, applied here the double pisaranko plot where uh, we have plotted uh, x axis uh, the carrier concentration and y axis uh, cv coefficient value and uh, these are the uh, parameters which is used in double band pisaranko model from here we can see that delta ec which is the difference in light conduction band and heavy conduction band is decreased uh, for annealing at 480, 480 degree centigrade sample so <clears throat> this 
this decrement in delta ec which is called the band convergence which is a hot topic uh, now uh, and uh, these are the schematic band diagram of the two samples where we can see that here uh, uh, the band gap is also changed here due to annealing which uh, this value is uh, extracted from thermopower data which is uh, using uh, by goldsmith equation uh, and uh, from uh, here uh, we can uh, conclude that band convergence has significant effect on uh, civic coefficient uh, enhancement we have also performed magneto resistance data for the for both the samples we can see here that for this sample the uh, magneto resistance value is uh, higher than this sample uh, and also it is seen that there is uh, linear magneto resistance at low temperature regime and uh, in the high temperature regime the uh, nature is not linear like parabolic nature and also the which is shown in uh, which is uh, which has been which seen in uh, which are seen in uh, both samples uh, also mr for the samples uh, at 480 degree is a decrease which is due to the defect induced in the sample and for uh, in-depth study of the magneto resistance we have plotted we have first calculated magneto conductance from magneto resistance data and plotted it for both samples then we have fitted by hln equation this is the hln equation where alpha is prefactor and uh, these are uh, well known uh, parameters and b is the magnetic field and alpha is the phase coherence length uh, now by fitting this equation we get these parameter for the samples uh, we can see here that the alpha value is decreased with increasing temperature uh, and also it is observed that for the sample S2, which is annealed at 480 degree centigrade, the L5 value is decreased. Uh, and decreased, that is, uh, which is lower than S1 sample. So, this is due to uh, the carrier scattering. This is elastic scattering. So, by annealing at lower temperature, we see that there is uh, uh, strong elastic scattering effect. Uh, to Rana, sorry to interrupt you you have two minutes yes. more okay okay okay, okay. i i am just uh, uh, beginning yes. of my thank you so we have uh, um, calculated power factor which is a square sigma for both samples we can see here that the power factor for the s2 sample is uh, significantly increased rather uh, the s1 sample and we have uh, measured the total thermal conductivity uh, in our sample uh, the total thermal conductivity there is uh, no significant change uh, at high temperature uh, around uh, error uh, the date, change is within error bar so uh, by using this power factor and total thermal conductivity we calculated zd that is figure of merit and we can see here that uh, the figure of merit is increased nearly 40 percent only by annealing temperature uh, so this uh, and uh, <coughs> here we can uh, here uh, we uh, <coughs> basically uh, there are several uh, strategies to increase uh, thermoelectric power uh, thermoelectric performance uh, like any alloying doping uh, uh, band con uh, alloying doping nano structuring etc but here we only tune the annealing temperature and and we uh, in we can we are able to enhance the thermoelectric performance of our sample so uh, here only by tuning concentration and formation of defect uh, due to different annealing condition has influence in transport properties which make a significant change in thermoelectric performance. And now my conclusion is uh, we have synthesized BI2T3 uh, via solid state reaction method. Excited technique employed for 
check fit purity and the structural characterization uh, was done uh, thoroughly and raman spectroscopy study was uh, carried out we have uh, ob we have extracted lattice thermal conductivity gear concentration mobility calculated resistivity cv coefficient has been measured double band pisaranko model shows conduction band convergence and magnetic resistance was carried carried out and power factor and zd is calcul uh, calculated so my group member uh, dr aritra banerji my supervisor and my joint supervisor dr sudipto bandopadhyay and uh, subarnoda pintuda suchandradi uh, so thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Ja Mr. Jana, uh, for a nice uh, presentation regarding the thermoelectric power of Bismarck telluride system. And uh, audience, you have uh, any question? Any participants has any question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So nice work, Nobu. So yeah, I just want to ask you that in one of your slides you have shown for the first sample the resistivity is much higher, while for the yes. sample which is blue, which is it's much lower. So why it's like that? Could you please explain it? Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, this uh, blue yeah, is yes. uh, so red is four eighty degree, which is higher than the blue. so we have calculated carrier concentration uh, you can see here that the carrier concentration of the sample uh, which is red is low so carrier concentration is low in the 480 degree sample and uh, higher in uh, 550 degree centigrade so resistivity uh, is uh, obviously resistivity should be higher in red Achha, so, okay. and okay and Uh, further we have uh, studied uh, team uh, where we can see that there is defect uh, which is present in the, this uh, red one uh, also uh, the explanation for this resistivity increment is uh, uh, area concentration as well as the defect induced uh, okay yeah Achha, so it's basically for the both thing <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Rana, here is also you have mentioned that all samples are metallic in nature. Yes. And after that, you are saying that it is n-type. Yes. So because because the, if the resistivity shows the metallic in nature, uh, then uh, the it it is a, when you are measuring the electric, uh, I mean the uh, VI characteristics. At that time, you are yes. getting the uh, the linear or it is means ohmic or it is short key quantum. What do you think? Uh, uh, basically, uh, we uh, we got the linear linear VI uh, data because uh, uh, here we uh, we uh, measure resistivity uh, by uh, by uh, variation of temperature where we have applied the current in the sample uh, fixed and we have measured variation of temperature and uh, the voltage. Which is uh, very yeah, which is change due to due to actually uh, the next change day. in temperature. So here uh, we have uh, the applied current is uh, the value such like that uh, we get the ohmic nature of the uh, data. So uh, at so uh, the ohmic nature is there uh, and there is some uh, nonlinear behavior which is due to some uh, defect or Yeah, uh, but but like but this. in the next figure, you have mentioned that negative value of CV coefficient indicates samples are yes. n-type in nature. Yes. So yes, basically, basically B I two T three B I two T three is a degenerate semiconductor. Hmm. Means that the band gap is very low. Uh, uh, I have uh, I have yeah. shown a scene here that is uh, band gap is very low. Okay, so. Uh, So this is a degenerate semiconductor, any, metallic type nature, not semiconductor, but degenerate semiconductor. Okay. Anyway, that's a good presentation, and uh, I think due to the limit of time, we cannot uh, accept more question. So I am going for the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Amitabh Moitra. Thank you, thank you, Mr. J uh, Rana. 
so please uh, um, conclude your part thank you uh, again for your good presentation and now i am going to the next speaker um, thank you he is dr amitabh moitra uh, from raidigi college and um, his um, topic of today's presentation is the dislocation precipitate interaction in aluminium magnesium alloy so uh, dr moitra please share your screen dr moitra please share your screen hello uh, dr moitra are you here i don't think this here at this moment <laughs> I think he is not here. Somehow uh, he is not here. So maybe then we can go for our next presentation. Yeah. Uh, so the next presenter uh, for today's uh, is Mr. Shomo Saha from Bidhan Chandra College, Risra, West Bengal, and uh, his uh, topic is nuclear reactions. in dissolved resonance region so uh, mr shomo saha uh, is available here mr shomo saha i don't think so Okay, then uh, we can continue with uh, Mr. Rana is given the presentation. So, if any questions regarding this, maybe we can accept, right, Dr. Dhara? Yeah. At this moment, uh, we can accept here uh, any question on uh, Rana's presentation, Mr. Rana's presentation. Then I think uh, with permission of our session chair, we can conclude in that case. Yeah. Any question? Any question? Hello. Yeah. No participants, participants, you have any questions, any queries for the previous presentation? Okay. If no, then we can conclude this session. Yes, for sure, we can conclude the session and. Ladies. Uh, uh... yeah Do professor bhattacharya yes madam uh, is there any any more speaker that i am just asking in this session no in this session only three speakers were there invited speaker was there so um, okay so maybe we can uh, conclude here uh, i just uh, one confirmation from our convener dr swarup niyogi if you can say anything so uh so uh, only one speaker is present in this session so can you wait uh, sir uh, two to three minutes more so that if some uh, means the next speaker is from uh, i think uh, amitabh moitra from raideki college and uh, then somu saha from uh, rishra bidhan college if they can join and uh, if not then we can conclude and we can start the next session from uh 2 pm i think 2 pm 2 pm we can then meet we can start again okay just uh, one announcement in chat box i have shared the uh -huh. feedback link for day 1 session 1 please fill it it's important for us only please fill it all the participants uh, present here please fill up the a uh, feedback link for day one session now
Have you declared the session to be concluded? Sharu? Professor Chatterjee? Yeah. Is the uh, session is concluded, declared concluded or? Yeah, I'm just waiting from Dr. Sorkar, so it's uh, Sarup Niyogi. Oh, he did time uh, to contact the I, speaker. I think so. I think so. Okay. Okay. So let us switch. So, uh, uh, hello, Oparajita, madam. I am audible, sir. Uh, I am trying yes, to contact. Yes. Okay, yes. I am trying to contact with the speaker, but unable to do it. Okay. So let us start. Uh, so let us conclude this session, and I request the organizer. I request the participant to please be join uh, one forty-five, so that we can start the session right at two p.m. Okay. From 1.45 p.m. This is the same Zoom link. Papiya Dhara, madam. I think this is the same Zoom link. So please join from one. Same Zoom link, yes. We are continuing uh, through same Zoom link two days. Okay. So uh, we can start the next session from 2 p.m. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, the session chair, sir, and uh, operator, madam. Thank you, Somna, sir, for nice uh, sharing the session. Nicely.
Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, so we can leave now, na? Rejoin after the lunch. Yes. Forty-five. Yes. Yes, sir. We can leave.